Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Adwaita Gradhara Shiva Sari Go Bhakta Vrinda Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Adwaita Gradhara Shiva Sari Go Bhakta Vrinda Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gradhara Shiva Sari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Rama Rama Hare Hare Welcome to our discussion of the glories of Sri Advaita Acharya. <laughs> it is impossible to adequately describe Sri Advaita Prabhu. Many devotees know much of Sri Tadhanya Mahaprabhu's unlimited glories, and many devotees know of Nichananda Prabhu's glorious activities and qualities, but not so much regarding Advaita Acharya. Although all three are Prabhu's, they're all, as you know, in the category of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. There's Mahaprabhu, Swayam Bhagavan, the cause of all causes. And there is Nichananda and Advaita, who are the main limbs of the Chaitanya tree. So we'll attempt to speak something about Advaita Acharya and his crucial role that he plays in Chaitanya Leela. We'll begin by explaining how Advaita Acharya in his other capacity as an intimate limb of Mahavishnu plays a key role in the creation of the material world. But he relishes much more his key role in Gorlila. <laughs> As Srila Prabhupada explains in one purport in Sri Titanya Shari Tamrita, all the incarnations of Godhead would rather forget that they are Ishwars and just participate in Gorlila as servants of the Supreme. So I often point out how our disease in the material world is that we want to be 
the supreme controller, and the supreme enjoyer. That means we want to be God. We don't admit that to ourselves, but that's where it's at. But here you see the actual supreme personality of Godhead as Bhakta Avatar, Advaita Acharya, the incarnation of the Lord's devotee, and Nichananda Prabhu, Bhakta Rupa, the form of the Lord's devotee. They want to be devotees because they know the secret that the devotees taste more bliss than the one they're devoted to. <laughs> jai Jai Sri Titania Jai Nityananda Jai Advaita Chandra Jai Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Jai Jai Sri Titania Jai Nityananda Jai Advaita Chandra Jai Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Jai Jai Sri Titania Jai Nityananda Jai Advaita Chandra Jai Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Om Gyana Timurandasya, Gyananjana Shalakaya, Chakshur Militangyena, Tazmai Shri Gurave Namaha. We were explaining how Advaita Charya Generally speaking, you say he's Mahavishnu, from whom emanate all the material universes. More specifically, you can say that Advaita Charya is an intimate limb of Advaita of Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu glances over the material energy. And, uh, at, and his limb, also the Supreme Personality got it, infuses the material energy. So it becomes full of dynamics. So roughly you can say Advaita Charya is Mahavishnu. And then if you want to drill down, there's more detail. <laughs> And he also has a confidential role in Vrindavan. <laughs> Described for all of you who relish those intimate details. Described in the Gaur Ganadesh Deepika by Kavi Karnapur. Advaita Char is also known as Sadashiva, something to do with Lord Shiva. And anything to do with Lord Shiva is the most complicated subject matter. Shiva Tattva is just, <laughs> it's more complicated than Guru Tattva. <laughs> but we're going to focus on how through Mahavishnu, Krishna creates the material universes. And it's through that same Mahavishnu as Advaita Acharya that Krishna expands the Sankirtan mission. So you're seeing now expansion in terms of the material universes coming from the body of Mahavishnu, expansion of the Sankirtan movement coming through Advaita Acharya. Haribo! <laughs> Advaita Acharya would rather be considered always as a servant of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as described in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita sometimes Advaita Acharya suddenly jumps up in the air and cries out I'm the servant of Lord Chaitanya. I'm the servant of Lord Chaitanya. I'm the servant of his servants. And then he sits down quietly. Other times he jumps up. Nichananda and I are servants of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
and he sits down and quiet. <laughs> when will that day be ours? When through genuine outpouring of spiritual ecstasy, we'll jump up like that. So satisfied just to be servants of the Supreme Personality of Godhead through Parampara. When will that day be ours? And there's no limit. <laughs> there's no ceiling over the head. You go on and on and on into the depths of serving Krishna. Into the ocean of flavors. There are Samrita Sindhu. When it comes to the time for Krishna to appear, his predecessors, his elders, appear first. Nanda Maharaj, Yashoda, Devaki, Vasudev, Sandipani Muni, all the elder members who take superior positions in Krishna Leela, superior in that they're elder to Krishna. They come first. That's the process. And the same thing happens in Gaur Leela. <clears throat> Mahaprabhu's elders, those acting in the role of superiors, appear first. That means Madhavendra Puri, who is the spiritual master of Ishwar Puri, who is the spiritual master of Sri Dhanu Mahaprabhu. And of course, the parents of Mahaprabhu, Shachi Mata, Jagannath Mishra, and Advaita Acharya. Advaita Acharya is the God brother of the spiritual master of Sri Titanya Mahaprabhu. So besides Advaita Chari being elder in age from the material point of view in Gaur Leela, he's also elder in terms of spiritual lineage. So Mahaprabhu always treats him as his superior and Advaita Chari doesn't like this. <laughs> He sees himself as the humble servant of Sri Taitanya Mahaprabhu. Advaita Acharya schemed how to arrange that Mahaprabhu will chastise him. He longed for that experience. He didn't want to be treated as an elder or superior. So he knew just how to do it. He started speaking and teaching Mayavad philosophy. <laughs> if you've heard any lectures by Srila Prabhupada, what to speak of reading his books, you know. <laughs> it's intolerable for Srila Prabhupada to hear Mayavadis speak their nonsense. That reminds me of a Prabhupada Leela. By your association, I'm starting to get a bit spontaneous here. <laughs> I heard this from an eyewitness in Japan. One elderly Indian gentleman I met in Japan in the 90s came up to me and said, you know, I was present when your Swami, your Swamiji, Srila Prabhupada, came to Japan in the early 70s. And I don't understand. And he described what happened. There was a Hindu program <laughs> of mosh, hodgepodge. <laughs> and so they decided to invite Srila Prabhupada and the handful of devotees then in Tokyo at that time, in Japan at that time, just to add, 
more variety to the mosh, to the hodgepodge and create some excitement. <laughs> so Prabhupada and the few devotees were waiting to speak and they're sitting in the audience and one Mayavadi after another came up to the podium and began to speak <laughs> Mayavad nonsense. And devotees told me that Prabhupada was getting increasingly restless with each speaker. He was... <laughs> Uh, and then finally, he, he he couldn't take it anymore. Well, the next in the sequence of Mayavad speakers was at the podium, describing the absolute truth as formless, personalityless, qualityless. Prabhupada turned to the devotees in the audience and said, "Jump up on the stage and make kirtan." <laughs> <laughs> so all, it's about eight devotees rushed the stage, jumped on the stage, interrupted the speaker, and you know, cartels, whompers, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. <laughs> so the the Hindus didn't know what to make of it, and <laughs> so now. More 25 years later, this Hindu gentleman hadn't forgotten it. He said to me, why did your Swamiji do that? He disrupted these sadhus. <laughs> so Advaita Acharya knew the best way for me to incur the wrath, to finally be chastised by Sri Taitanya Mahaprabhu, is if I go around talking Mayavad philosophy, and then I'll finally be punished by him. Oh, I want that so much. I'm tired of him treating me as his elder, his superior. So he did that. And sure enough, Mahaprabhu tracked him down and was ready to thrash him. <laughs> which satisfied Advaita Acharya so much. You see, what happened to Advaita Acharya's private secretary made Advaita Acharya greedy for chastisement because his private secretary was chastised by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. What happened was, Advaita Acharya came from Navadweep to Puri. Remember, Navadweep and Puri are described to be like two rooms of the same house. That's why Sashi Devi, Mahaprabhu's mother, was satisfied that by Mahaprabhu being in Puri, she easily get news about him because there's so much um, interaction between Puri and Navadweep. So Advaita Acharya would yearly come to Puri with the entourage from Navadweep. And his private secretary, Kamalakanta Vishwas, accompanied him. So while in Puri, Kamalakanta decides to pay a visit to the king, Prataparudra. Those of you who have read Chaitanya Charitamrita are familiar with King Prataparudra, the great devotee king of Puri during the time of Mahaprabhu's presence in Puri. So Kamalakanta goes to him and says, I'm going to prove to you that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he did that through Shastra. And then he said, and by the way, oh, wait, let me make a little correction here. Uh, 
I'm going to prove to you that Advaita Acharya, excuse me, is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he did that. He proved in discourse that Advaita Acharya is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He proved that to the king. And then he said, by the way, Advaita Acharya has a debt. He owes 300 rupees, which back then was big sum, not like 300 rupees today. 300 rupees today is like five US dollars. <laughs> so the word got back to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Puri. That Kamala Kanta, on the one hand, says Advaita Charya is the Supreme Personality Godhead. Yet on the other hand, he's telling the king that Advaita Charya has a debt, a financial debt. So Mahaprabhu didn't like this at all. He said, this doesn't make sense. This is actually some kind of atheism. How can you say that the Supreme Personality God is a debtor? So he made the proclamation. I don't want to see Kamala Kanta again. So certainly can understand how devastated Kamala Kanta was. This is an example of how sometimes taking whatever comes your way as a devotee is difficult. But in all circumstances, we have to see Krishna's mercy. We're bhakti yogis. Real yoga is more than simply physical exercises. It's about seeing everything in its connection to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Mahaprabhu made that declaration. I don't want to see him again. This was a blow for Kamala Kanta. But what was Advaita Acharya's reaction? Oh, such mercy, such special attention my private secretary is getting. He's being chastised. He's being punished so personally. I never get that. <laughs> and then Advaita Acharya said, this reminds me of what happened to Sachi Devi, Mahaprabhu's mother. She criticized <clears throat> Advaita Acharya because her eldest son, Vishwarup, had taken sannyas. And, and before leaving for sannyas, her eldest son, Vishwarup, would always attend Sanskrit classes given by Advaita Acharya. So Sachi Devi thought she was adding one plus one equals two. <laughs> Your name is Advaita, she told him. Togetherness. Oneness, but actually your name should be Dwaita because you're splitting up families. <laughs> you're prying people apart. <laughs> and she was afraid. If my Nimai goes near you, the same thing is going to happen. So... Nimai Pandit, Maha, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, took this as an offense. And he told his mother, he chastised his mother, you've offended Advaita Acharya. You have to touch his feet and ask for forgiveness. Somehow or other, Advaita Acharya was absorbed in transcendental ecstasy, practically unconscious, floating in the ocean of prema, love of Krishna. And Sachi Devi took the opportunity to take the dust of his feet. <laughs> so Advaita Char is re recounting these examples. Look at the great fortune that Kamala Kanta is getting. I can't get it. So devotees went to appeal to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. You said that you'll never see Kamala Kanta again. 
Can you please be merciful? Of course, Advaita Chai, I remember saying, that's mercy, that personal interaction, that, <laughs> that intensity, I didn't get it. So anyway, Mahaprabhu said to the devotees, all right, bring him here. <laughs> and then Advaita Chai said, what is this? I am being doubly cheated, <laughs> twice. <laughs> I never get any personal treatment like this. First, you chastise him and say he, he can never see you again. And now you're saying, bring him into your personal presence. <laughs> I don't get this mercy. It's only one thing to do. I've got to provoke Mahaprabhu's anger. I'm going to go around teaching Mayavad philosophy. <laughs> it's a little difficult to understand, isn't it? It's like, who wants the mercy of being chastised or denied the presence of Sri Dhanya Mahaprabhu? We want good times. We're good time addicts. Let the good times roll. That's what bhakti is all about. <laughs> Neophytes can think like that. But actually, as you advance in bhakti, you realize that real yoga means how to connect everything, how to link everything to the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, how to use everything in Krishna's service, whether happiness or distress. And yes, we have to really beg for that ability because when distress strikes, it's not easy to take it as Krishna's mercy. When you read about Queen Kunti Devi's and her, and her prayer, may these catastrophes happen again and again, because then I see Krishna again and again. The real catastrophe is not seeing Krishna. So if by the so-called catastrophes happening, Krishna's with us, then I say, let those so-called catastrophes happen. But the worst catastrophe is Krishna is not with us. I know this sounds like, when will I ever be on that platform to say such a thing truthfully? We aspire for the higher levels of bhakti. And by hearing about them, something in the heart starts to awaken. We're shackled by materialistic consciousness, which means we love material happiness and we don't want any material distress and that's our order we give to Krishna. I'll serve you and you know what to give me. Material happiness, material satisfaction, and no distress. <laughs> this is our program. Bhakti in its mature, ripe state is something else. So let's hear about Advaita Charya appearing and what did he find in the world? A world de devoid of bhakti. There were very few devotees in Navadvip. There was everything Vedic going on in Navadvip except bhakti. There was logic, there was in personalism, there was demigod worship, there was mystic yoga powers, <laughs> everything except bhakti. So therefore, we have this verse in Chaitanya Charitamrita that Prabhupada would sometimes recite. Keho pape, keho punye, kore vishoy bhog, bhakti gandanahi jate, jai bhavaro. Everyone was engaged in material enjoyment, whether sinfully or virtuously. No one was interested in the transcendental service of the Lord, which can give total relief from the repetition of birth and death. So let's look at the first part of this verse about Advaita Acharya's environmental scan. He's looking around at his surroundings and noting a 
atrocious. Everywhere someone's doing simple activity, everywhere someone's doing virtuous or pious activity. You find that today? <laughs> you look around and you see everyone performing either sinful or virtuous activity? No, you don't find any virtuous activity. No one even knows what that is. <laughs> Just try it. Just ask someone on the street, uh, are you doing any virtuous activities? <laughs> I don't even know what the word means, virtue. <laughs> virtue, integrity, these are lost concepts because the world is drowning in sinful activity. And yet we expect peace and tranquility. This is the amazing thing. So at least during the time of Advaita Acharya's presence, he found some pious activity, good karma activities going on. But he rejected both the bad karma and the good karma activities as unwanted. He's looking for the transcendental loving service of Krishna. And he didn't see any interest in that. Even though, as I said, he found so much Vedic and quasi-Vedic stuff going on. Astrology and speculation on the impersonal Brahman and worshiping demigods. And he found all that. But what about the conclusion of the Vedas? Not a trace. Bhakti Ganda Nahi, not a trace of bhakti did he find. And what is the significance of that lack of bhakti? How then can there be relief from the real disease? So this is a very important point in our outreach. What to speak of our inreach. Birth and death is considered a disease. So much so that we don't give much credit to the solving of what goes on between birth and death. Between birth and death is old age and disease. Unless you can solve the whole package of material existence, which is a disease, how can you say you're successful? How can you say that you're making genuine human progress? So this is our unique presentation as bhakti yogis, as Krishna conscious persons. We know what the real pandemic is. We know what the real virus is. We're taking on the essential problem of material existence. So let's hear from the purport in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. Advaita Charya saw the entire world to be engaged in activities of material piety and impiety without a trace of devotional service or Krishna consciousness anywhere. The fact is that in this material world, there is no scarcity of anything except Krishna consciousness. Material necessities are supplied by the mercy of the Supreme Lord. We sometimes feel scarcity because of our mismanagement, but the real problem is that people are out of touch with Krishna consciousness. Everyone is engaged in material sense gratification but people have no plan for making an ultimate solution to their real problems, namely birth, disease, old age, and death. These four material miseries are called bhavarog, or material diseases. They can be cured only by Krishna consciousness. 
Therefore, Krishna consciousness is the greatest benediction for human society. So I'd like you all to think about this because you may have read it so many times. The four miseries, birth, death, disease, and old age. Yeah, yeah, yes, right, right. right. <laughs> but consider they're part of the whole package of material existence, which is considered to be a disease. Bhava rog. Literally, bhava means things that become and unbecome. So it's a disease involving things becoming and unbecoming. That refers to our body, our mind, all the material relationships and possessions. They're part of this becoming and unbecoming. So how do you solve that disease? So a newcomer to bhakti immediately learns that the main problem is pushing aside the disease we should be concerned with and then being worried about so many supplementary or incidental diseases when the main disease is material existence. How are you going to deal with that? That's your career. That's your occupational calling. So as you may have read in Bhagavad Gita, actually taking up bhakti means you're declaring war on the illusory energy. You're not wasting your time in political squabbles, arguing over whose resources belong to who. You know the real battle is with the illusory energy. So this is what affected the heart of Advaita Charya. I'd like you to meditate on that point for a while. Unlimited universes come from the body of Mahavishnu and unlimited compassion comes from Mahavishnu as Advaita Charya. So Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami in Chaitanya Charitamrita says, Seeing the activities of the world, the Acharya felt compassion and began to ponder how he could act for the people's benefit. For those of you who want to get the special mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sri Nityananda Prabhu, Sri Advaita Acharya, you're thinking, what can I do for the true benefit of the people. What can I do to solve this virus, Bavarog, the disease of material existence? So again, focus on that boundless compassion. We've got to start somewhere with our interior work. And by focusing in this way, we take steps forward. The fruit has to begin in the green stage, so to speak, and then ripen. So don't discount the beginning steps. Every journey starts somewhere. So we can take impetus on this appearance day of Sri Advaita Charya to consider the suffering of the people and what we can do about it. What is the real source of their suffering? So Prabhupada writes in the purport, this sort of serious interest in the welfare of the public makes one a bona fide acharya. And acharya does not exploit his followers. Since the Acharya is a confidential servitor of the Lord, his heart is always full of compassion for humanity in its suffering. He knows that all suffering is due to the absence of devotional service to the Lord. And therefore, he always tries to find ways 
to change people's activities, making them favorable for the attainment of devotion. So it's a whole mindset. I hope you're getting it now. <laughs> this is real human life we're talking about here. And this is a discussion of real transformation. <laughs> real social change, real personal change. I remember during my university years, it's a time of student activism in the USA and Europe. Every student was kind of a radical, you would say these days. And so we were always thinking how to change the political system, how to change the economic system. But I began in my studies, I could see that after the big social change, after the big election, after the revolution, after this, after that, the same old song. <laughs> same old song with a different beat, but still same old song. <laughs> because no one is dealing with what Adwaita Acharya is seeing. So bhakti yogis are very concerned with society, very concerned with changing society, but we know what is the actual cause of change, of real change. And we know what is superficial. <laughs> the example the acharyas give especially Shula Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasi You've got a boil. Okay, maybe you never had a boil on somewhere in your body, but you might have gotten stung by a bee or <laughs> even a mosquito bite that's so itchy. Have you ever tried blowing on it as a solution? <laughs> I got this boil or bite on my arm. <laughs> what does that do? <laughs> so this is an example the acharyas give about material solutions. Now, this doesn't mean that if, I often point this out, if you break your arm and you go to the doctor and he patches you up, you don't say, well, I don't have to thank you because I'm not the body. <laughs> That's fanaticism. If you have a rip in your cloth, in your clothes, and someone patches it up, sews it or something, you thank the person, even though you know you're not your clothes. <laughs> so we're grateful in a limited way for anyone who does some patch up work with our material affairs, but we know they have not solved our real problems in life. That's the point. <laughs> so you have to see everything in perspective. We're not fanatics. We're not ungrateful people as bhakti yogis, but we see everything in perspective. So therefore remember what Advaita Acharya has pointed out. I don't see any solution to the main problem. I see people doing pious activities, good karma. I see people doing Im impious activities. And as we already discussed, these days you don't see anyone doing good karma. <laughs> it's a disaster what you see. Now let's consider the humility of Advaita Acharya again. He as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Bhagavan, is capable of solving the problem. But he sees himself as a submissive, humble servant of Mahaprabhu. He's Vishnu Tattva, but he's seeing Swayam Bhagavan, Mahaprabhu, the cause of all causes. He's seeing that 
Advaita Chari is seeing himself as the servitor of the original Supreme Personality of Godhead. And so therefore, in that kind of humble mindset, Advaita Chari is thinking, this situation is so bad, unless Swayam Bhagavan, the original personality of Godhead, appears himself, there'll be no remedy. Now you might say, well, at least back then, 500 years ago or so, people were performing some good karma, some pious activities, some virtuous activities. What about now? Where is Advaita Acharya? Where is Krishna? <laughs> Society is becoming a madhouse, increasingly so. Everyone's becoming so flagrant about it. <laughs> politicians are urging people just be open with the, the fact that you hate other groups just be open with it <laughs> get on with your life hate <laughs> fear <laughs> and as you all in the UK know <laughs> follow the COVID rules strictly while we're having drunken parties <laughs> at the government offices <laughs> It's so <laughs> out in the open these days. <laughs> so where is Krishna? Chaitanya Chari Tamrita teaches us how to look for Krishna amidst these very bleak and degraded times. Kali Kale Nama Rupe Krishna Avatar. Krishna is here as Nama Rupa, the form of the holy name of the Hare Krishna mantra. Oh, how serious we should take our chanting, because that is directly the presence of Krishna. So Dwaita Acharya is thinking, and his thoughts are revealed by Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami and Chaitanya Charitamrita. If Lord Krishna would come as an incarnation, Lord Krishna himself could teach bhakti by his own personal example. And that's, of course, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So let's focus on the dynamics of Advaita Acharya inviting Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to appear. Remember, Advaita Acharya is the Supreme Personality Godhead, but out of humility, because he's seeing himself as a servitor, he's saying, the situation is so bleak and bad, I can't do it. <laughs> we have to have the original Supreme Personality of Godhead, not an expansion, but the original. Let him come. So sometimes Lord Chaitanya would describe how he came. He said, He's referring to himself as Mahavishnu because all possibilities are contained within Krishna and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna and Krishna is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. They're both Swayam Bhagavan. So all possibilities are there within him, including Mahavishnu, who reclining on the ocean of milk breathes out millions of universes. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, I was reclining on the ocean of milk and I heard these loud cries. Come, come, you must come. <laughs> I heard the loud cries of Advaita Acharya. Advaita Acharya had a very simple program of worshiping. Stalagram Sheila with 
water from the Ganga and Tulsi leaves. And while doing that puja, he's crying out with loud cries, calling out to Chajan Mahaprabhu, please come, please come. So that's why Lord Titania describes himself in his capacity as Mahavishnu. I was reclining peacefully on, <laughs> on the ocean of milk and these loud cries <laughs> stirred me. So he would always say like that during Gorlila. He would always say like that to Advaita Acharya. Your loud cries brought me here. Your fasting, your prayers, your cries brought me here. And now I'm here. <laughs> Similarly, Mahaprabhu credited Advaita Charya with telling him this session of Gaur Lila is finished. Your mission's accomplished. I'm sending you away. You see, Jagannanda Pandit, upon the order of Sri Taitanya Mahaprabhu, was visiting Navadvip. Mahaprabhu told him, deliver these items to my mother, give her this message. So Jagannanda Pandit, taking leave of the Vaishnavas in Navadvip, is going back to Puri. And so Advaita Charya sent a message with Jagannanda Pandit to give to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And when Jagannanda Pandit got to Puri, he read the message to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And no one could figure out what the message meant except Srup Damodar, who is such a confidential associate of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He instantly knew what the message meant, but he kept quiet. What did the message say? It was like some kind of mystical poem from Advaita Acharya. The message said, in the marketplace, rice is no longer in demand. Tell that personality, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who's mad with love, that everyone has become mad just like him. <laughs> so when this message was read, all the devotees gathered were puzzled, except, as I said, for one. What, what does this mean? In the marketplace, there's no more demand from rice. Tell that person who's mad with the love of God that everyone else has become mad too. And this letter is written by another mad person, mad in love of God, Advaita Acharya. <laughs> so Mahaprabhu responded, Advaita Acharya is a great mystic yogi. He writes letters. He writes messages even I don't understand. <laughs> and then he went quiet. He went quiet, thinking. This is his order. And then Mahaprabhu explained, Advaita Acharya brings the deity into the world and then sends him away. In other words, Advaita Acharya, through that message, was telling Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, your mission is accomplished. The whole world is drowning in love of Krishna. You can move on to the next universe. Because as you know, once every day of Brahma, Krishna comes. And immediately after the appearance of Krishna, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu comes. That's once every 8,640,000,000 years. And you happen to be <laughs> at, here on this planet at this time. Out of just 8,640,000,000 years of times and places 
in which you could appear in whatever body. You're here during Lord Taitanya's Sankirtan mission. So that gives you the cosmological perspective to your life. So Mahaprabhu took that indication from Advaita Chari. You brought me into the world and now you're sending me away. Another ecstatic pastime of Advaita Chari. His mock fighting with Nichananda. There's such variety on the spiritual platform. Bhakti yogis relish all this variegatedness, even at the level of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You have the original Krishna, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and then you have the immediate expansions of Nichananda and then Advaita, and they interact. They're persons. Some people have a hard time swallowing that. Oh my God. How, why is everything in bhakti so personal? <laughs> the personal affairs on the spiritual plane make whatever we're doing in terms of personal relationships look so inconsequential, so tiny. So rather than think that the activities of Advaita Acharya, Nichananda Prabhu, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are mythological. Better we think our activities are mythological <laughs> because we're so tiny. You walk on the street, you may see some ants and just <laughs> ants <laughs> here today, gone a few minutes later in terms of their existence. But this is how the demigods look at us, <laughs> like little, little tiny ants. Here one moment, next moment, moved on to the next body. So the genuinely consequential and monumental activities are those of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, his incarnations, his expansions, and his devotees. This is why Chaitanya Charitamrita is so important. It's presenting you with the nectarian characteristics of the eternal living force and showing that the, the spiritual variety is unlimited. So Advaita Acharya and Nichananda tricked Mahaprabhu to go to Shantipur. You see, Advaita Acharya has a house in Shantipur and Navadweep. And he go back and forth between those two houses. So Mahaprabhu had just taken sannyas. And wanted to run to Vrindavan. Where is Krishna? Where is Krishna? He's showing you the real purpose of renunciation, detachment, and bhakti. Everything is focused on how to please Krishna, not simply detachment and renunciation for its own sake. There's no such thing as detachment or renunciation in bhakti just for detachment and renunciation to exist on its own. It has no standing in bhakti without giving pleasure to Krishna. So as soon as Mahaprabhu took sannyas, he wanted to run to Vrindavan. And he was in the lost in the loving ecstasy, feeling separation from Krishna. He didn't know where he was. Wandering day and night, he had no idea where he was. And some or other, he came across 
Advaita Acharya and Nityananda. And in ecstasy, Mahaprabhu asked, oh, you're going to Vrindavan too? <laughs> they didn't tell him, you're actually right in the Navadweep area, <laughs> right near Shantipur, the house of Advaita Acharya. And you know, Nichananda conspired with Advaita Acharya. Yes, this is Vrindavan. Yes, yes, just come with us. Come along, come along. <laughs> the river you're in now, you're bathing in the Yamuna. <laughs> come with us. <laughs> Lord Chaitanya, be, although he was lost in ecstasy, transcendental love of Krishna began to consider. Now, wait a minute. They say they're going to Vrindavan, and that's how they happen to come across me. But it's kind of odd that I run into both Advaita Acharya and Nityananda Prabhu. Where am I actually? And then they told him, well, actually, <laughs> we gave you directions so that you would come near the house of Advaita Acharya. We'd like to invite you for lunch. We promise you there'll just be a few simple vegetables only. <laughs> so Lord Titania, well, you misled me. I said, no, no. We, you wanted to go to Vrindavan? Wherever you are, that is Vrindavan. So. And actually, it just happens that the side of the Ganga that you're bathing in can be considered Yamuna. <laughs> because at some point, the Yamuna and the Ganga meet together. And so this side of the river of the Ganga actually contains Yamuna water. <laughs> so Mahaprabhu agreed to go to the house of Advaita Acharya and all the devotees from Navadvip gathered there. The first time they're seeing Mah Mahaprabhu after he took sannyas, without his beautiful hair, his mother, Sachi Mata, also came. So it's lunchtime. And that means it's time for a few simple vegetables? No way. <laughs> Advaita Acharya had Mahaprabhu and Nityananda sit down at their plates, at their places, and Advaita Acharya also sat there. And Mahaprabhu said, look at all these preparations. I can't eat all this. It's not the job of a sannyasi. It's not the proper behavior of a sannyasi to eat so much opulent food. Advaita Chari said, stop your word jugglery, please. <laughs> Let's get to the facts. You eat in Jagannath Puri in the temple there. You eat huge quantities of food 54 times a day. <laughs> in other words, you're Lord Jagannath, and we in, in the Puri temple, you get 54 offerings a day of huge quantity. Why are you making a big issue out of the little bit of prasad we're having here? <laughs> so Advaita Acharya told him, look, we'll make a compromise. Just eat half of every bowl or dish and you can leave the rest all these this big spread of clay pots and banana leaves loaded up with preparations they just take half of each one and that'll be all so Mahaprabhu began taking prasad and every time he finished the half of a clay pot or banana leaf loaded with preparations, Advaita Chara would put more on. 
Does he eat half? Does he eat half? Mahaprabhu would eat half and then more on, more on. <laughs> Prasad pastimes are so, such a wonderful part of Chaitanya Charitamrita. So, they're eating and eating and eating. They're the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They can eat the whole universe. Why eat one universe? They can eat billions of universes. <laughs> so they're eating and eating. But Nichananda Prabhu is not satisfied. He suddenly proclaims, I have been fasting for three days. What you're giving me is not enough to fill even half my belly. <laughs> This is, after all, this enormous quantity of, of prasad. I had hoped to break my fast today, but look at this. This is just uh, such a tiny amount of food. Advaita Chai told him, look, why don't you just, in so many words, he said, why don't you just shut up? <laughs> These interactions are so extraordinarily inconceivable. You're seeing the spiritual world in its variegatedness, not only amongst jivas, part and parcels of Krishna, but the avatars, the expansions themselves have their varieties, which are unlimited. So Nichananda is playing the role of the outrageous avaduta. Abhaduta, for those who don't know, means someone who knows the Vedic injunctions and the Vedic behaviors, but totally ignores them and just ignores any social formulas, any social protocols, just does whatever he likes. <laughs> we don't act in this way. <laughs> Our outreach would not be appreciated. <laughs> so Nichananda is known as Nichananda Avaduta. So he can be like that. And he was accusing Advaita Charya, you've misled me, you haven't fed me. <laughs> and Advaita Charya is saying, oh, just see my, my mistake. I invited for lunch such a reject Paramahansa. <laughs> That's such a parmahantu, so faulty. <laughs> it's a contradiction in terms. Of course, Nichananda is the ultimate parmahantu. <laughs> Dwayne Chai saying, it's a reject parmahantu. It's a phony parmahantu. <laughs> and Nichananda said, whatever I am, I am. It's your duty, though, to feed me. You invited me to lunch. So finally, Nichananda just gets up and in an apparent display of hot temper, takes some rice and just tah, throws it on the floor. <laughs> and some of the rice grains cling to a Dwaita Acharya, who begins to dance in ecstasy. Oh, how purifying this is. I've been hit with rice thrown by Nichananda. <laughs> what characters. <laughs> but Nichananda replies, you have offended Mahaprasad. Your only remedy is to invite 100 sannyasis for lunch and feed them all. Advaita Charya says, look what I've gotten into just by inviting one sannyasi. I'm not inviting any more to my house again. <laughs> In this way, they're carrying on. <laughs> so I love that section of Chaitanya Charitamrita because it shows you have the complete whole, the Om Purnam. <laughs> Dealing with another complete whole, the Om Purnam. How does that go on? You can't speculate these kind of things. You see, the supreme absolute truth 
expands himself into parts, you know that, the living entities, but he also expands himself into other complete wholes. Otherwise, how can Krishna be perfect and complete? Krishna has the ability to expand into parts as well as other complete wholes. That is truly being perfect and complete. So today on the glorious appearance day of Advaita Acharya, we want to focus on his compassion, his boundless compassion. Through him, the material universes are created and through him, the Sankirtan mission expands because of the compassion of Advaita Acharya. So I thank you all for allowing me to say something about the Panchatattva, Sri Advaita Acharya Prabhu, Sri Nichananda Prabhu, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. We can take a, one or two questions if you have any from our Cardiff devotees. Any questions? So everyone is just taking in the glories of Advaita Acharya. Maharaj? Yes. Um, I mean, I a, one of the questions I was wondering is, um, why did Advaita Acharya say that now it was time for Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to to go back, that his mission was complete, even though um, you know, you, I'm, I'm sure there were many souls who didn't yet have Krishna consciousness. What were the parameters for his completion of his mission? You have to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> he saw that it was sufficient. What he, what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had done, Advaita Charya, so it's it's sufficient. And you have to understand, Advaita Charya is not simply seeing the present, but he's seeing the future too. The universe is already flooded. That's what Chaitanya Charitamrita tells you in the seventh chapter of Adi Lila. The universe is already flooded. The more the Panchatattva dance, the more the flood of love of Krishna increases. It's going on. <laughs> And you get to play such a key role. <laughs> Just consider when our Srila Prabhupada was in his last weeks with us and devotees were begging him to please stay. He said, you can't go now, Srila Prabhupada. There's so much more to be done. Prabhupada himself had said that he hadn't started Varnashram Dharma and, and devotees pointed out to him, you haven't finished Srimad Bhagavatam. And Prabhupada replied, what I've done is enough. Sometimes persons ask, well, someone like Bhaktivinoda Thakur was capable of spreading bhakti all over the world. Indeed, why didn't he do it? Srila Prabhupada explained that he's leaving us with some service. <laughs> so the question is who will get the credit? Because the universe is already flooded. That opportunity is there to engage in devotional service. So who get the credit for connecting people, connecting the jivas to what's already going on? By reading Chaitanya Charitamrita, your vision will expand. It takes some transcendental vision or 
some progress toward transcendental vision to actually see the answer to your question. But by reading Titania Charitamrita carefully, your vision will deepen. But I can understand you're asking that question because you look at the world and the shape it's in, the confusion, the hypocrisy, the total lack of sense and mind control. And you wonder, this is much worse than when Advaita Acharya looked around and saw that there was just good karma and bad karma. This is much worse. But keep this in mind. The way a servant of Mahaprabhu sees things, it's this. The more out of it people are, the bigger the opportunity is for service. <laughs> That's what Nichananda thought when he heard about Jagayamada. This is, a, if we can get them to be Krishna Bhaktas, what an impact that'll make. that'll truly glorify our master, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So it's a different way of looking at the challenging circumstances we have today. They're an opportunity for more service. An opportunity to be easily recognized by Krishna. All right. <laughs> Anyone else? Hi, Krishna. Good um, In this Chaitanya Charitamrita, it says that um, Advaita is known as Acharya because he teaches the science of devotional service. So I was wondering. What does that refer to? Does it refer to him, you know, his involvement in bringing Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, or is he known as like being a teacher? You know, did he ever? Yes, yes. He was the senior Vaishnav. He's the god brother of, Ish of Ishwar Puri. They're both disciples of Madhavendra Puri. So he's the senior to Mahaprabhu, and he's famous for expounding bhakti. That's what he was doing in Navadweep and Shantipur. So Advaita means he's non-different from the Supreme Lord. And Acharya means he teaches by example. So he was like a venerable elder of the devotees in the Navadweep Shantipur area. And there weren't that many devotees back then because Navadi was like a chakra, a capital of everything Vedic, except the conclusion of the Vedas. <laughs> so you can just imagine what it was like when Mahaprabhu heard that Advaita Chaya was propounding Mayavad philosophy, <laughs> the, the great Acharya, the great expounder of Bhakti is now teaching Mayavad, impersonalism. But Advaita Charya, as we said, knew how to how to get Mahaprabhu going. I want to be punished. I want to be chastised. I'm tired of his treating me like I'm his superior. So that's what he did, as we already discussed. He be, he taught as a Pseudo Acharya, he, he taught nonsense. And then when Mahaprabhu came chasing after him to thrash him, he was in ecstasy. Ah, now I have attained the perfection of life. <laughs> Anything else? Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Um, 
you talked about it earlier about how um Udvit had a, a quite a broad vision about what mercy was, even in seeing people being chastised or being neglected. Um, so I'm just wondering about how can we accurately perceive uh, any situation when there's mercy? How can you perceive what's that? How can we accurately perceive any situation that comes our way as mercy? Uh, it takes some transcendental effort. It's not always easy and we really have to beg but sometimes we're driven to our knees why is this happening to me and so yes we have to stretch a bit and krishna never stretches you more than you can handle but we think oh it's too much it's too much <laughs> We hate being reduced to the position of beggars. We want to be in control. <laughs> but the essence of bhakti is that let Krishna be in control and we are his servants. So it takes effort. Love takes effort. Developing love takes effort. Even material affairs take effort. Even devotee relationships take effort. Where I'm staying here in Melbourne, Australia, at the house of <laughs> devotee Sevamrita Devi Dasi, who has two children, two sons, and her husband, Bhagavad Gita. And I see parenting takes effort. <laughs> it just doesn't drop out of the sky you know the children are born and they want time they want attention <laughs> so those relationships take effort energy i can see the mother gets so tired you got two boys and they're just full of energy racing here and there <laughs> non-stop throughout the day that takes energy so why can't we invest some energy in learning how to be bhakti yogis and connecting everything to krishna it does take an effort i will agree with you it's not that oh we're all just like kunti baby let the catastrophes come again and again <laughs> We've got to work at that consciousness. We've got to beg and pray about it because this body is going to end. I've got news for you. <laughs> Your youthful vigor will be dissipated. <laughs> if you live a full life, you're going to be an old man. <laughs> Your body will break down. So why not use this life, this one life, for tolerating the material energy and becoming attached to Krishna? Living in the material world takes tolerance for a devotee. You have to tolerate the imperfections of your body and mind, tolerate the imprints of your past karma, previous desires, but it's just for a short time. Life is so short. So it takes energy. It takes commitment. Any relationship takes commitment and energy. What to speak of bhakti. All right. Anything else? I see a hand in the back there. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Thank you for the class. And uh, um, I have the question about uh, in the beginning of the Adi Lila in the eighth chapter. There's a verse um, which basically says that who doesn't offer respect to Lord Chaitanya as a demon, 
Yeah, problems to understand this when you expand on this a bit. How could you, if you know about changing Mahaprabhu, and you say, well, I just accept Krishna, but I don't accept changing Mahaprabhu, or I accept changing Mahaprabhu, but I don't accept Nichananda, you've made a grievous distortion. So why would you do such a thing? You must have some asuric or demoniac tendencies. Otherwise, you could never make that kind of cleavage, that kind of distortion. Well, there's Krishna, but this Chaitra Mahaprabhu, I don't know about. Or there's Chaitra Mahaprabhu, but Nityananda, I don't know. I, don't, I can't. He's such an avaduta. It's a statement made out of love. <laughs> Chaitanya Charitamrita is the love book. <laughs> but we, it shows us we don't really know what love is. So Kabi Raja Goswami is just saying, look, if you can't, if you can't handle this, if you don't understand this, there must be something wrong with you. It's an in-your-face statement, as people would say these days. <laughs> He's in your face. <laughs> Out of pure love for Krishna. And that's what Chaitanya Charitamrita is all about. If you can't see this reality, there must be something defective in your vision. You must be insane. In fact, you must be a demon. <laughs> it's a statement of ecstasy. Keep reading Chaitanya Jerry Tamrita and gradually you'll see what's going on. Okay? Hare Krishna. I see we have, I get to see something of the Soho temple, which I haven't seen for so long. <laughs> All right. So it's past my dinner time. You're giving me the real feast. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Adwaita Char Pabuki Jai. Jai. <laughs> <laughs>